for my talk, um, the question again is, um, I mean, I'm very intrigued by all these ideas at TED, how to improve the world, how to make the world a better place, um, facilitating progress and so on. So a question I was always asking myself is, can art, especially fine art, actually make a contribution? As you may know, the traditional answer is, or the traditional hope, is actually yes. And that was called the idea of the avant-garde, thinking that the artist was actually at the forefront of innovation progress initially. Well, this is roughly 100 years ago, and we may not actually have the feeling today that this is so much innovations are not necessarily coming out of the art scene. Maybe this is what we think. And quite frankly, I'm also myself um, very skeptical. However, I, as was indicated, before we come to any conclusion, so this is the background question I would like us to have in mind. And I would like to introduce um, some examples of artworks which I find have certain things in common. As we just heard, they actually have economic, an economic element in them. In other words, there is a transaction part of the artwork, which is kind of unusual because normally you would say, no, 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 art and business, very distinct domain in society, isn't it? And both have actually very strong opinions about each other, yeah? The banker may not highly respect the artist who is somehow living for another currency and the artist may have strong prejudices against business people, isn't it? So let's have a look and then later come back to the question what actually could we learn maybe even if we are not artists, we are not inspiring, aspiring to be artists, is there something to be learned? And I leave it to you, of course. So let's follow, um, or let's have a look at a couple of artworks and this um, kind of notion of or what I call transactional art. As I say, art and business in a provocative way brought together, hopefully. What I don't mean, just quickly, I do not mean the business of art, like all sorts of exhibition, art fair, galleries, um, Mezzanatentum and so on. I also don't mean artists who actually reflect economic topics, yeah? Andy Warhol drawing dollar signs or something like that. What I mean is there has to be a transaction as part of the artwork. As part of the artwork, yeah? This is in the tradition of so-called conceptual art. So that means some, some sort of value is actually exchanged. As you imagine, the notion of value is a very loaded concept. Various disciplines, yeah? Not only economics, but also philosophy, cultural values, anthropology, psychology, yeah? All sorts of sociology, huge, um, huge concept. So of course, if a value or if values are exchanged, we could ask, okay, what kind of value, who is exchanging values in which context? And I show you examples in a moment. And then I also observed conversion of capital. Capital we tend to think of as economic and monetary capital, isn't it? But Bourdieu, French philosopher, says, well, there is actually, there are other forms of capital. And for example, there's something what he calls cultural capital, everything related to education, social capital, so to speak, our networks has a value, symbolic, maybe our status symbols, but maybe there are even other forms of capital. So basically I'm saying this is converted in these artworks. Let me show you my favorite example. The superhero of contemporary art is Marcel Duchamp, Frenchman, who actually decided to pay his dentist with this self-drawn check. <laughs> More provocative, Marcel Duchamp wants to go gambling. Not to Macau, not to Marina Sands, but actually at the time to Monte Carlo. 
wants to raise some funds, therefore issues a bond. So the bond looks like this. And I think he issues 30, um, 30 bonds to his best friends or buddies, 500 um, each. He promises 20% per annum to be redeemed in three years. And goes gambling, too bad, loses it all. Somehow manages to pay back after one year 10%. And the rest he pockets, never paid back the principal or anything. Now the question I always ask is, are the people holding this bond happy or not? What do you think? Are they happy or not? I forgot to mention, and that's important, Duchamp was already a famous artist at the time. So what do you think? Was, were they happy or not? Why? Because, because let's, let's look at it in the various forms of capital. We have the nominal value. Fine. But on top of that, we actually have a cultural value, and that is having a real Duchamp. <laughs> having a real Duchamp, my goodness, that is something, right? We get it, yeah? Immense value. You can auction that off immediately. And third of all, social value, because not everybody had access. You needed to be a buddy of Duchamp. And no internet, no Facebook, no marketing, whatever in order to have access to this thing. So in a way, this is what I mean by conversion of capital and what I also mean by exchange of value in an artwork. Yeah? Notice, there is a deal. It's actually creating a deal, amicable deal. Yeah? There is an element of self-empowerment. I mean, who can issue a bond anyways? Yeah? Can I issue a bond? Can you issue a bond? Yeah, so um, that, and there is even an illegal, uh, violating the legal principles, yeah? However, this was not Singapore, so nobody really cared, yeah? <laughs> okay, I, this was um, the in-detail example. Now let me browse very quickly through mostly contemporary art, and what I observe is it's increasing. I, so I have a website where you can look up, or if you're interested, uh, an ad. Uh, all sorts of transactional experiments. So interesting, I feel there is a trend. Especially internet facilitates that. Historical example, Yves Klein selling empty space in Paris for gold and then throwing away the gold into the Seine because he was not trying to enrich himself. Remember, traditionally, art is free, la pour la, Art is autonomous, and certainly art was not understood for centuries, actually ever, that the artist enriches himself. Yeah? Therefore, here the art, artist throws it away, actually. Other one, artist is reading hashish, but officially tobacco, and then giving it <laughs> away. Here is somebody, I mean, artists suffer money, right? Mr. Box issues his own bills and tries to pay, like Duchamp, in the supermarket with these bills. Now, if the cashier does not have the social capital that what she is offered is actually a fortune, because Box is a very high traded, right, highly considered artist, she may reject. You see the point? Social capital and, and, and sort of economic and maybe even um, cultural capital, yeah? If, if she does not have the education to know Box is, a, is an, an art, a famous artist, she will reject it, possibly. Borak Icon, um, visualization of his daily expenses. Here is somebody sending out little robots in exchange for food, and the robots will draw some, some little drawing, which you can keep, but you have to return the robot to the artist. And that way the artist makes a living. Yeah? If you don't return it, karma will beat you. That's what he says. Organizational structures. Artists in the 90s created companies, issued shares, had actually inspiration from the financial industries, mutual funds in order to 
um, facilitate all sorts of critical projects, yeah, had shareholder value um, performances, reflected business consulting, yeah, not exactly McKinsey, uh, here, conflict management and other services uh, normally only um, offered by, the, by business uh, consultants. Of course, shops become also an art or an, an, um, a subject of artistic expression, so to speak, there is an offer. May not lead to a transaction, but the idea of offering something does tell something about the artist and, of course, also about the audience. With the internet, auction art comes into play. Artists using existing transactional platforms, eBay, in order to auction off their capacity. You can book Kerry Peppermint for 15 minutes making, together with him, commissioning a video work. And he shares the intellectual property rights with you. He auctions also off his body, so to speak, no, no uh, sleazy connotations. This one is awesome. This box sits in the, in the museum, has a program which goes online, auctions itself off, so somebody owns it. It still sits in the museum, so somebody owns it, and then after some, some time, sort of this is extinct and, and it goes online again and auctions itself off. Yeah, we don't know where the money goes, but <laughs> imagine, probably to the artist, hopefully. Marketing, also reflected. Riz Ingold started only with this, and just claiming here's the merchandising. He never had an airline, but he did it so long until he had an airline. Some sponsor, <laughs> some sponsor flew from a fancy uh, exhibition, flew him over, yeah? And uh, same here, uh, net bikini, very classical work, co customizing your bikini online. Outsourcing commissioning. This is a very classic piece as well. Somebody going to Pakistan in the 70s, briefing a little village, create these carpets, and then sort of return them. This is collaborative uh, painting. This very interesting. Go online and bid for the right to influence an artwork at the San Francisco MoMA, Museum of Modern Art. You may, let's assume you, you get that um, right. Then the artist has actually hired another artist who is doing some installation. And according to your instructions, this installation is changed. I mean, we, are, we may not find that very pleasing. But conceptually, it's actually very interesting. What is it in financial terms? It's basically a derivative. It's an option. It's the option, the right, to influence another artwork. Here, the artist say, gives a call and says, well, send to me little sheep, all looking to the left. I'll pay you two cents. Then he collects them, sells them off for 20, $20. Yeah, massive uh, thing, collaborate uh, little tool. Here is a virus hitting on, um, uh, with Google, based on Google Ads, and basically generating revenue, which is then fed into um, a, another algorithm trying to, to buy Google shares. So in a way, Google is eating themselves it, itself. <laughs> Was, of course, interrupted. I mean, uh, very quickly, uh, Google objected and uh, successfully, yeah? Because it's illegal. It's, it's hacking. It's basically illegal. This is, again, by, um, by Aaron Kobling. Imagine you draw. You, you get this, but, and you reproduce it with a little drawing tool. And what all these people create together is actually this kind of bill without knowing that they are collaborating on the internet platform. Here, this is important, also deal making. Yeah? Artists acquire the rights for this little animation 
this figure, which is a pure animation figure, and then let other artists use this data set to create narratives, stories, animations, and so on. So in other words, it's a licensing process, a very normal practice in the creative industries. Yeah? Other artists also working with contracts, which is, so to speak, the legal form of any transaction. This I hope you like. This was happening uh, at the Beauty Exhibition 2002 in Singapore. And what happened is the artist felt, well, the Singaporeans are not really embracing the art, so why don't we pay them? <laughs> and here is, they say, well, sums above $1 will be offered by the artist to encourage Singaporeans to keep on uh, one of their creations. Yeah? Because they feel, well, normally the Singaporean audience is not risk-taking enough, so why don't we pay them? Um, artists always also presenting themselves as CEOs, as business uh, men, as employers. Here is one very, very provocative piece. This artist pays these people in Mexico City who happen to be drug addicts in their preferred drug. Very provocative um, piece. The artist paying drug addicts in their preferred drug. Big discussion, yeah? Alienation, um, exploitation, um, buzzwords around that. Um, last category artists creating currencies, Atelier van Lieshout issuing their own currency. 100 van Lieshout are worth 100 beer. Yeah, we all know uh, Linden Dollar and so on. Then also interesting marketplaces become actually artworks facilitating transactions. Here you can meet Russian brides by in, in Holland. This is a bar which um, in real time displays the fluctuations of the beer price in real time. So depending on your consumption, prices will go up and down. We all can imagine the feedback loop and the, the, the dynamics, yeah? Um, this one won a prize at Ars Electronica, those who know Chinese. Interesting because it really distributes cultural capital and it's a platform. If you travel to a remote area of China, bring some books with you, yeah? Last category, sort of finance as a meta business, also reflected by artists. Here's somebody sort of day trading in the gallery. And as an outlook, we talked about or we heard about derivatives. Imagine one could actually learn from financial industries, use um, practices of risk management, for example, to hedge our personal life, to hedge love, to change, uh, support life changes, and, and so on. So basically, to sum up, what I feel these artworks have in common is they are art, art, arts with incentives, so in a way, the interaction, which is another genre, interactive art, becomes a transaction. You have these um, self-empowerment, art as deal-making, negotiation and contracts, actual negotiation power becomes relevant, yeah? If you don't have money to acquire the right, you cannot participate, very cruel, yeah? Appealing to rationality rather than just entertaining and interdisciplinary art and business both that both success criteria actually have to be fulfilled in a way some meta art forms. So coming back to the question, what can we actually learn even if we are not artists? So is there some value? And um, I don't know, but I think what would be interesting is using these two buzzwords. Um, here you see me blushing. Because how bad can it get, yeah, buzzword wise? But I actually think strategic creativity is an interesting thought, maybe, to ask what have, besides artistic, what have, besides artists, what have any leaders, um, what, what has the creativity between artists and other leaders in common, actually? Is there something? Yeah? 
I mean, let's think of business leaders, military leaders, state leaders, and artists, maybe in the same category. Why not? I come from Europe. In Europe, the whole contemporary art discourse is very anti-capitalistic, anti-establishment. It's a, it's a very, very strongly felt um, discussion, which I, in this kind, actually want to provoke. I feel this discourse is a little bit um, trusted. And I would like to, therefore, make this provocative claim, well, value creation rather than deconstruction. Let's try to create value as artists, or who cares as anything? Yeah? You don't have to be an artist, but maybe get inspiration from, um, from these kind of um, experiments. And then the last word is creative deal making. As I say, in Europe, the social system, so many things fall apart. Everything is in transition. The, for example, the social contracts between the generations do not work anymore. So whoever feels entitled, why not think and experiment with creative deal making, in a sense. Yeah? If these works help or not, who cares? Who cares, actually? Yeah? And I hope to save the avant-garde that, that the artist may may actually contribute. For that matter, I think many artists should actually or could, con could acquire a lot of economic knowledge, which um, normally is not sort of part of the art um, practice. Artists have conquered technology, biotech, all sorts of domains, but not yet finance and economics. All I'm saying is I don't know how many artists are here. Um, normally, this, as I say, was meant to provoke also Western artists. Yeah? However, for Singapore, I think as well, creative deal making can never uh, hurt. Thank you very much.